to my path Oh, your word will not be shaken Your word will never fail me Like a fire
continue to praise God together this morning.
place our hope in you, that we can run to you and turn to you.
My name is Jeremy Nowen. I'm a leader of the Orphan Care Ministry, and I've been an elder at Restoration Church since we began. As the leader of the Orphan Care Ministry, I work on setting the goals and organizing our team to uh, both recruit new families into fostering and orphan care and to uh, help them support those families who do that. So that's my goal is to, is to make sure that our church is moving with the orphan care ministry and the orphan care ministry really is moving with our church and drawing more people into the world of fostering and adopting. Hi, my name is Susan Nowen and I lead the child care team for the orphan care ministry and we have been going to Restoration Church since its beginning. My role as the child care team leader is to provide child care to our foster and adoptive families. My name is Anna Moling and my husband is Robert, my son Oliver. Um, we've been attending Restoration Church for four years. My role in the orphan care team is to lead the advocacy team. Hi, my name is Emma Rosa and I have been in Restoration since the Christ Fellowship days. My role in the orphan care ministry team is to help lead our meals team. I'm Mercy. My husband Jeff and I have been members of Restoration for about four years now. My role on the orphan care team is to manage the social media pages for the ministry. My name is Monica Grace. I have been a member of Restoration Church for two years. I am the leader of the prayer ministry. The heart of my team is to petition the prayers and place them at the feet of the Lord and to encourage the families that they are not alone. And I would say for all of you that are listening and watching this, um, to be involved, many of you are called to care directly for orphans and widows. I honestly believe that. It's in, it's in the Bible. It's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's James. It's not an addendum. It's, it's part of the word. And we are to care directly for orphans and widows around us. Um, and, and for others of you, it's to support those, those people who are doing that. And there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, we have great teams where you can, you can jump in. And I'd say talk to any one of us, um, that, that myself or any of the, the leaders of our teams, and, and be involved. It doesn't take too much out of your time, out of your, your energy, your resources to do that. And it means so much, just one thing, one meal, or, or a couple hours of your time in, in um, doing childcare. And it means so much to receive that, that uh, you don't need to give a lot and you're going to give a lot to us. Good morning, church family. <laughs> I'm so glad you chose to join us today on this um, very interesting Sunday that we find ourselves in. And today is a special day uh, near and dear to my heart. It's Orphan Sunday. So my name is Susan Nowen, and that handsome guy on the screen is my husband, Jeremy. And we are um, the leaders of the, the orphan care team and also foster parents in this church. So um, Jeremy is unable to be with us today. So I want to start my time with you together by reading a letter from him um, to, to the church and then end by celebrating just some of our accomplishments in our first year of ministry here. Good morning, family. I would have loved to have shared this time with you, but the team is with you, and they are the heart of what we do. As you saw their faces on the video, now I want to take some time to tell you about the amazing people who lead this ministry. I'm so proud to serve with them. Mercy Rice is our biggest cheerleader. She loves to see what's taking place in our ministry and uses pictures and video to raise awareness and let others know what's happening through orphan care at Restoration Church. Monica Grace is the leader of our prayer team. She is our personal liaison for prayer. She truly embodies prayer without ceasing and is such an encouragement to the members of our team. Emma Rosa leads our meals team and is devoted to the care of orphans and our families. She single-handedly put together the Christmas drive for Restoration Church last year for our foster family and the kids at his house, Children's Home, which is one of our partner agencies. Enma has been a personal blessing to the Nowen family by helping us with child care throughout this past year. Anna Moling leads our advocate team. Anna is quiet and steadfast. She has a fierceness when it comes to orphan care and leads her team well. I love how she plans her work 
and carries out not her own work, but empowers her volunteers to do the same. And last but not least is my amazing wife, Susan. <laughs> Personally, she started our family's fostering journey some 15 years ago by asking the question that was very scary to me, what if we adopted a child? Ministry-wise, she leads our child care team and so is so beautifully creative in how she leads. Her creativity has bled over to enabling this team to meet one of our goals for 2019, which was to create a resource team. It was this team that met all four of our goals for 2019, including doubling the number of foster and adoptive families within our church. It was also this team who has set increasingly challenging goals for the year and will pursue them healthily and wholeheartedly. It's my honor to lead this ministry, empowering these teams to fulfill our vision of seeing more families waiting for children than children waiting for families. So this brings us to you. Where do you fit into all of this? Many of you are directly called to care for orphans in our community. You too have that same uncomfortable feeling that I had when Susan asked me about adoption. And that discomfort is the reality of the Holy Spirit's call on your life. Rest assured that you will have the amazing hearts of these leaders and their teams to guide and care for you as you step out in obedience into what God is calling you to. Whether you are not ready to answer that call or clearly are not called to foster or adopt, we have a place for you on our teams. Most urgently, we have a need on our meals and child care team. Every meal made or ordered or delivered and every hour of child care is such an enormous blessing for our foster and adoptive families. With minimal use of your time and talents, you can make a huge difference in the lives of one of our families. And fellas, the biggest reason there are so many orphans among us is the absence of fathers in our community. You are desperately needed. Listen to God's calling on your life and follow it. You are not here simply for yourself and your immediate family. I urge you to lean in to what we are doing and join us as we care for orphans among us. So as I wrap up my time with you today, I personally want to celebrate some of the things that have been going on in the orphan care ministry this year. First and foremost, I want to repeat it again, we have doubled the number of foster and adoptive families within our community. I'm so grateful to these families who have stepped out and said, we don't know where this is going, but we are going to follow you, Jesus, in this. Our meals team, they have made... Um, over 15 meals that have been delivered and made with love for our families. They provided food for over 50 people at our first informational meeting last year about orphan care. They provided all of the meals for our licensing classes so our families didn't have to worry about that. And they made these beautiful cookies and created um, a fun activity for our kiddos at our first ever parents' night out. The meals team is just amazing. And ladies, thank you for the love that you put into each meal. Uh, we are so grateful. My child care team, Celine, Greg, and Michelle, provided child care for all of our licensing classes. They provided in-home child care on at least five occasions so parents could have a date night. And as I just mentioned, we've hosted our first ever quarterly parents' night out where parents could come and drop their kids off at the church and go and have a few hours to themselves knowing their kids were cared for by, all, by our child care team. I'm so grateful for them and the way that they served. Um, one of the goals we had this year was to, um, at first we thought we would try to establish our own resource closet. Um, oftentimes, foster families or foster children don't have what they need when they show up at the home of a foster family. So we wanted to have a place where um, our families could go and get what they needed, basically, um, without having to outlay a bunch of money. So one of the ways God met this goal was through our new partnership with Homestead Christian Academy, um, who also has a nonprofit called um, the Children's Alliance of Florida. And my dear friend Nicole directs this school, and it is her heart um, to have this closet available to foster families and under-resourced families in our community where people can come and get what they need. It's just been a huge blessing to connect with her and what she's doing there and her teams there. And she has just invited our family to partner and be involved in any way that we can. So through your donations, um, 
we've been able to help Nicole, who's here in the back hiding. Uh, we've been able to help Nicole stock her closet and just raise awareness that we even have this available in our city. And many of you saw the video that my two girls, Stella and Esther, made earlier this summer to introduce our partnership with Homestead Christian, um, which was a, a huge success. And it was seen by community members. And do you see all the donations there? It's incredible seen by community members, including um, a local real estate agent who fundraised over $3,000 to give to the closet to help them get started, which was a huge, huge blessing. So it's been a joy to see how God would use something small, like let's just make a video and see where it goes and then multiply it um, for his kingdom. So the last thing I want to just wrap up in saying is one more thing that we have started uh, with Homestead Christian is every Friday they faithfully serve our community and give out food. Um, this started with our orphan care team, just volunteers coming every Friday to hand out food. Our volunteers have kind of dwindled because a lot of our labor was children who <laughs> are now back in school. Um, but Nicole and her staff every Friday are out there and we hand out food and it's just, it's fun. It's really fun. You can physically do something with your hands. And so I encourage you, if you have a, fr a few hours on a Friday, we could use your help. Um, and we can tell you more about that as well. And one person, Luis Cairo, I just want to mention him by name because he has faithfully come Friday after Friday after Friday to hand out food to our community. So thank you, Luis. So would you join us? Would you join our team? Would you talk to us about how you can be involved? I love these people. I love working hard for the gospel of Jesus with these people. I've never felt so cared for and loved. Fostering and adopting is hard. It's hard. It's, it's the hardest thing we've ever done as a family. And these people, they wrap around and love us so, so well. So I invite you. Come join us. Come be a part of what we're doing. Even if you don't know how, come talk to us. We'd be happy to get you plugged in, connected in any way that you feel called to do it. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Please find us in the back. We're wearing the Orphan Sunday shirts. We can answer any questions you have at the end of the service. Well, good morning. My name is Steve. I get to be one of the pastors here. Thanks for being here and for joining us online. Let's just pray together, shall we? Father, we love you. We're amazed um, by your grace to us that we were lost and we were apart from you and you came to us and brought us in, adopted us to be sons and daughters. It's a beautiful story. The gospel is amazing. And the more we treasure the gospel, the more we can't help but live that out thankful for the Nowens. I'm thankful for Susan and Jeremy and their friendship, their leadership, their partnership in the gospel, their faithfulness, and for the way that you have continued to provide avenues for our church to be the church in this capacity. God, would you strengthen and sustain the foster and adoptive families in our church? Thank you for the beautiful kids you bring into our homes and into our lives in the way that it's not just good news for those kids, but it's for the family, that, that we are changed because of how you're bringing relationships together. It's powerful when you're the center of that. So Lord, thank you. Sustain us, use us, lead us in this next year that we would see not just more things happen, but greater and bigger hearts for you and for this city and for the, the children, the thousands of children that are in foster care. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, what a great day. Uh, let me just get settled here, but I also want to just um, talk to them afterwards. If you want to learn how to be involved or connected in that, if you want to be connected to our church in any way, uh, you can. there's a connection card we have in the back, or if you're watching online, there's a way you can fill that out online as well, but we can help get you connected to a group, to a ministry team. We have a class that meets in here on Tuesday nights as well. That's just been a joy to, to walk through some things there together. So if you're looking to connect, we can help you do that. I also want to say thank you for your faithfulness to give. Your giving matters. It's making an impact. Even the ability to start uh, an orphan care ministry in this way with all these different teams. We partnered with an organization called Backyard Orphans who came and helped train us and show us how this 
works as they're doing this for churches all across the country. And so we support them and we encourage them in what they're doing as they're equipping more churches to get involved in this way. So thank you for your faithfulness to give. You can do so in the back or you can do so online, okay? All right, we are going to continue through the book of Revelation because that's where we're at. So if you have your Bible, take it out, open that up. We're going to be in chapter 3 today, chapter 3. We're actually skipping the end of chapter 2. <gasps> why would you do that? Here's why. Because next week, Alex Piscina from Summit Church is going to come over here and teach that letter, the end of chapter 2 to us. He's teaching it over there today. And I'm going to take this letter that we're doing today and take it over to Summit Church next week as we're both walking through this together. And then we're going to do a worship night together on November 20th over there. And so their church also does foster care and adoption. They've gone, so we're just really two sister churches partnering together here in the city. And so that's what's going on. You got all that? Good? Okay, great. So Revelation chapter 3, we're going to be in verses 1 through 6 today. Revelation 3, 1 through 6. Are you there? I don't think you're all there. Are you there? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Revelation 3, 1 through 6. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember, then, what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will, wait n if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you. Let's pray. God, thanks for your word. Thank you that you give this to us, that in this moment, at this time, this is the, the word we need to hear from you. You've preserved your scripture generation upon generation. As nations have risen and fallen, as kings have come and gone, as all kinds of seasons have changed, you have always ruled and reigned and been sovereign over everything, and you always bring everything about according to your will and purposes. And so we can sit here today with all the things on our mind and our heart and going on in our world and our life, and we can say, Jesus, you reign, and we trust you, and we need you. And so would you use your scripture today, Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts? Would you rebuke us and correct us where we need it? And would you encourage us and increase our faith where we need it? We trust you, Lord. We thank you for your presence with us and your great grace and love for us. And all God's people said, amen. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you been to a mall lately? <clears throat> no, who goes to malls, right? There's like one mall left in America. I think it's Dolphin Mall, and that's where like, you know, you don't want to go there because there's too many. But for the most part, malls are struggling. Uh, a couple years ago, I was back in my home state of Missouri, and I was there doing a wedding, and I, uh, the hotel I was staying at was near this mall, and I needed a tie. I needed to get a red tie for my suit that would match their um, wedding party's c colors and everything. So I, I head over to what was the glory of Chesterfield Mall is what it was known. And this was the place when I lived, I mean, back when I lived there, it was all kinds, I mean, it was just, that's where you go. They had everything you could imagine. I just need a tie. So I walk into the mall, it's like a freaking ghost town. I was like, what is this place? Like, it's just like, there's nothing there. There's like the, the cage gates that are for the stores. They're just everywhere, just gates, like everything's closed. Uh, you'd see a store here, and then all these closed areas. It was dark. You'd walk through here, and it was like, in one space, there was actually grown men racing remote-controlled cars. What are we doing? What, is, what has happened here? I think I finally found a Dillard's and, and got a tie. I was like, where am I? What has happened? Retail experts earlier this year said that 33% of malls would close permanently by 2030. That was before the pandemic. How are malls doing since then? 
They now expect a third of malls to close by next year. Big chains like JCPenney, J. Crew, filing for bankruptcy, closing down. So what do you have? You have these huge malls, right? You have these histories. You have these reputations of life, of people coming through there and finding all of this and all of this activity. You have this reputation of this, but you walk in there now and they're dead. Well, here in Revelation 3, Jesus writes a letter to a church in the city of Sardis, and he says at the end of verse 1, you have the reputation for being alive, but you're dead. You're dead. You had a history of being this church. You had a history here, and you have a reputation and a name for this. However, when I look at you right now, the true condition is you're a corpse. It's a sharp warning for the church to awaken to wake up before it is too late. It's a warning that the church needs to hear, not just back then, but the church needs to hear today. There's all kinds of statistics going around, but they're estimating a lot of churches are going to not make it through this pandemic. The churches are closing permanently and will not emerge out of all of this. And it's not just because of resources or lack of resources, though that's important. But churches are dying for another reason. So the question I want to ask of this text, there's three of them. What is a dying church? How does a church revive? And then what's the reward for when you revive and restore that? What's the reward in it? What is a dying church? Is it one that just doesn't have resources anymore? No, it's a church that deserts the gospel. When a church has deserted the gospel, <clears throat> which will lead to abandoned resources or lack of resources. But verse 1, look at verse 1 of chapter 3. The second part of it, he says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Verse 3, remember then what you received and heard. What you received and heard, he says, and keep it. What did they receive and hear? The gospel. What made you become a Christian? You heard and received the gospel. What makes a church? It's when people who have heard and received the gospel. What is the gospel? got to be very, got to understand what the gospel is and be very clear about the gospel. One thing we've tried to be very clear about from the very beginning of our church is the gospel. The gospel is not what you do for God. It's the good news of what God has done for you in Jesus. That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That we who deserve God's judgment and wrath because of our rebellion and our sin, Jesus sees us in that helpless estate and he comes and lives a sinless life in your place. He fulfills all of God's commands for you. And then he dies on a cross as a payment for your sin and for mine. And that is, a, that is him absorbing the judgment of God in our place. And on the third day, though, he rose again from the grave. And his resurrection is the affirmation that the Father accepts Jesus' payment for your sin and for mine. And that through faith in him, he now gives you his Holy Spirit to live in you. And the Spirit now unites you to God, whereas you were separated from God, you are now with God. God dwells in you. And now you absorb and love this grace and this love, and it's empowering you, and it transforms you and leads you to live differently as children of God. Christian, let me ask, do you remember when you first heard this and you received it? Do you remember what that was like? When you first grasped and understood and received the gospel, you came alive. There was a a power in you, a power to say, you know what? I'm not going to live that way anymore. I'm not going to find my identity and worth and security and value anymore in those things. I'm not going to give of myself to those relationships and that that sin. I'm not going to do that anymore. I don't want to because I have a new heart and I want to follow Jesus who would do this for me. Do you remember that? See, over time, what can happen to Christians, what can happen to the church is we forget about the gospel. We drift from it. 
Kids, have you ever been out like on a raft in the ocean and you're just there? You're floating and maybe your parents are on the beach. Next thing you know, you look up and you can't find your parents anymore <laughs> because you've just drifted all the way down with the, the tide and the current has just carried you away. And you're like, how did, how did I get all the way down here? It doesn't happen immediately. It's a slow drift. It's being carried away by the currents of this world. And that's what happens is that we are not continually coming back to the gospel. We start to drift from it. In verse 2, he calls the church to strengthen what remains, that there's signs that while there's, he would say it's dead, there's also signs of life and there's evidence that it is dying as well. So we start to get spiritually weak and frail. We start giving into the sins of our past. We start going back to the old ways, the old beliefs, the old worries and fear and anger. We start looking like the world with lust, anger, division, angst, worry, accusations. No longer has Christ everything to us. Rather, we think we need these other things, and those are all warning signs the church is dying. It's lacking its power. It's deserting the gospel. In verse 3, look at verse 3. He says, remember then what you received and heard. And then he says, keep it. Keep it. It's a military term that means guard it. Stand your post. Don't desert your post, but guard it. I remember back in uh, 2009, the story of the uh, American soldier, Bo Bergdahl, who was captured by Taliban forces. And it had, when we heard this, we we're like, what, what could have happened? Like, how can a soldier from the greatest military in the world, how could he be captured? And so there was this whole dispute over what was going on. Come to find out he had deserted his post. He had wandered off. And when he deserted his post, he was now exposed to being captured and overtaken by enemy forces. See, when the church or a Christian deserts the post of the gospel, you are opening yourself up to be taken away by enemy forces back into all of these other things that are not what God has designed. And what's interesting about this letter is Jesus writes this letter to the church at Sardis. Now, we don't know what Sardis is, but history tells us what Sardis is. That it was a, it's a city. It's a now in modern-day Turkey. It was once a great city, had a great reputation. It was the capital city in the kingdom, the Lydian kingdom, which was 7th century BC. It had this river that flowed by it, and so the sands were of, of like gold. And this was actually the, the riches of this city, the wealth of the city was tied to this, and they became the first city to mint gold and silver coins. So they had this wealth, they had prosperity, they were powerful. They were rich, they were strong, but over time, the city failed to guard itself, failed to stand its post, and they would be conquered by Cyrus the Great and the Persian Empire. And then later, would be overtaken by the Roman Empire. So this city, which had a reputation and knew greatness, now all of a sudden knew what it was to be conquered, not once, but twice. And by the time this letter of Revelation is written, about the year 96, the city of Sardis was not what it used to be, and in the same way, the church that was there is not what it used to be. The church had gone the same way of the city. The church used to have a vibrant love for the gospel, a treasuring of the gospel, a, a fixation of Jesus, a beautiful witness in the city, but now it didn't. It didn't have that anymore. It had abandoned that. It had deserted that. It's not what it used to be. It had become like a mall. And much like today's dead malls that you could walk into, you'll still see things happening. If you go into a mall, there will still be some activities going on, somebody racing some remote control cars maybe or selling a red tie. But Jesus said in verse 2, I've not found your works complete. The works that you're doing, church, they just lack they're not complete. Something's off, even though activity is going there. See, when you desert the gospel, you desert it for other things, other activities. But 
Like what? Well, one is this. The church can desert the gospel for church traditions. A dying church holds to those church traditions, though. These are the kind of churches where you have to dress a certain way. You got to look a certain way when you come in. You have to listen to a certain kind of music. You have to only play certain kinds of songs. We have to run certain types of programs. Why? Because that's what we've always done. We've always done it this way. I I love church planting because you get to start new churches and you don't have these traditions of how we've always done it. But what's funny is you get a couple years in and it's like, wait a minute, that's not how we've done it. We're just people who get stuck with tradition. Look, some of y'all sit in the same seat every week. Those of you at home, you're on the same couch. <laughs> right? Like, you, 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 there's something about this is, and we just get comfortable, and we hold on to those traditions. There becomes less prayer, less reliance on the Holy Spirit. Why would we need to seek the Spirit, even though at the end he says, listen to what the Spirit is saying? We don't do that. Why? We've got our traditions. We know what to do. We just need to execute it better. We desert the gospel to do religious stuff. Maybe you personally, you feel like when you're, you're, you're just dry and dead spiritually, and so you start trying to do religious activity again. Well, I need to go to church. Well, I need to, I need to do this. I need to get baptized again. I need to take communion. I need to do, and you start thinking all these different things you need to do, like somehow that's going to do it. It's not about church traditions. In fact, the Pharisees in the Bible were known for their traditions. They knew the scriptures. Jesus at one point says, you go to the scriptures because you think by them you have life, and you refuse to come to me to have life. You know all the Bible stuff. At one point he says to them, you tithe perfectly. (laughs) You give it all the way down to the last little penny. You know exactly how much to give. He says, you should have done that, though, without neglecting things like justice, mercy, faithfulness. In the Old Testament, God rebukes his people. In Isaiah chapter 1, if you want to get rebuked by God, it's a good passage to read. He tells his people, he says this, stop bringing me meaningless sacrifices. Just stop it. I don't want to see them anymore. I don't want to smell your offerings. I don't, nothing. He says, when you do it, I'll hide my eyes from you. And then he says, when you pray, I will cover my ears and not even listen to you. Like a little toddler, la, 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 not listening to that. Why would he say that? Because they're just going through the motions of religious traditions and activity. It wasn't being born out of a heart and a love for God, an amazement of who God is and how God had rescued them and what God was doing in their life. It wasn't flowing from that. It was just going through the motions. And he says, rather than religious tradition, he says, you know what I want you to do? Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. Isaiah chapter 1. He's saying that if you really understand the good news of the gospel, that if you treasure that in your mind and your heart of the rescuing nature of God for people who are lost, if that really sinks in of how much God has done on your behalf, that it would move you to display that with your life. That you wouldn't turn your faith into just some religious activity where you go into a building to feel better about yourself. That it's actually played out in your life, in your relationships, and looking out for these things the way God has looked out for us. So don't desert the gospel for church tradition. Some, though, desert the gospel for cultural trends. For cultural trends. What is the culture doing? What are they doing? We got to be cool like them. We have to be like that. In verse 4 he says this. Look at verse 4. He says, Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. Sounds weird, doesn't it, to us? Sounds like, what, you have a few people didn't wet their pants? Like, that's what, I mean, just... What is he saying here? Soiling of the garments is a way that talks about moral impurity. That when you, they would have their garments on, and if they would rub up against something, it would soil or stain their garments. And now what was clean is now stained. It's soiled in this way. 
And so a church is dying when it focuses all its time on trying to be relevant to the culture. What's the culture doing? we got to do that. You start bringing the values and the, the thought systems and the, 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 the way of thinking and valuing things. You bring that into the church, and it starts to mix with the Scripture. It mixes with what God has said in such a way that it's no longer the pure essence of the gospel. You've mixed these things of the way of the culture with it, and you've stained. You're stained, he says. And I think this is happening in two key ways in America. The culture's view of sexuality and the culture's idolatry of politics. The cultural view of sexuality claiming love is love. It's all that matters. Do whatever feels good. After all, God is love. And so anything done in love, just as long as it's about love. And so what the culture does is the culture does not like the idea of a God who also calls for purity, holiness, and has judgment of sin. We don't like that. A bloody cross is offensive, so we mute that and we elevate love. And therefore, you just tie everything to love. So no matter what you do, as long as it's love and not hurting anyone, it's good. And when the church adopts that and the church drifts from the gospel and just says, well, God is loving and love, and so we just make it about love, and we start to embrace that, now all of a sudden, our garments are soiled, stained. We start to call good what God has called evil. We ought not do that. But equally as impure as it is to be agreeing with the culture sexually, it's also a great impurity to take your gospel and mix it with your politics and put them in the same spot together in such a way that you equate your politics with the gospel. That you equate your political party or your political leader as one who is God's person and you cannot question them or go against them. This is an impurity. This is an abomination. This is disregarding what God has designed government for, and this is now elevating and mixing this together in a way that is confusing to the world, for one, and is just radically impure about the purity of the gospel, of what Jesus has done and who he is and what he has done for us. Imagine being so angry about politics, about elections, that you can't love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Imagine being so irate about it that you are willing to scream and yell and, and demean people rather than love and serve and pray for those who persecute you and love your enemies like somebody named Jesus told us to do. Imagine that it be so much that you can't do that and you're known not for somebody who is trusting of the Lord and filled with mercy and compassion and grace and truth and mixing all of that together. Now you're known as somebody who does not resemble the character of Jesus at all because you've deserted the purity of the gospel to have your identity and your hopes wrapped into your politics soiled your garments. Jesus lovingly and sharply warns those who desert the gospel in this way to wake up. Come back to the purity of the gospel. The essence of who God is, what he has done, who we are in Christ, and what it means to live and proclaim his kingdom to every nation on the earth. Jesus says, if you do not wake up, he will come like a thief against you. Anytime it talks about coming like a thief, it's a warning of judgment, that God would come and bring a judgment to his people. Now, I don't know about you, but thieves have never warned me that they're coming. They just come, and you're like, what? Jesus loves us to say, I'm warning you now, I'm letting you know, because I want you to turn from that. I don't want that what just happened to be your fate. I want you to understand and come back so that you won't experience that. Because here's the thing, Jesus tells us that a church can revive by repenting. It's repentance that brings the revival. It's the turning back of our hearts back to him, of our trust in him. Verse 3, remember then what you received and heard. Keep it, guard it, and repent. Now, I'm sure that a church in their situation, 
they could probably look around their city and think, man, our city used to be great. It was so much better being a Christian back then. We had resources, we had money, we had a name, we had all of this stuff, but now it's hard. Now there's like the Romans are here and they're oppressing us. And it's difficult and the the culture is constantly telling us this and the government is forcing this on us and the government's doing this. And man, if we didn't have all that, our church would be in better shape. If they wouldn't do this, if they, if they, if they, Jesus says, no, 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 not about they, you, you repent. The church repents. Jesus says, you've soiled your garments. They didn't do that to you. You're not a victim of all that in such a way that you're okay with no longer being pure and focusing in on the good news of the gospel. You're not a victim of circumstances. You're not a victim of those things. Repent and come back to the gospel again. The way a church revives is always by taking ownership of its sin. Always. It's never by blaming others. Never. In fact, let's just play that out in some of our relationships. How well does it go when you want to bring a relationship back together? When you just start blaming people. Does that go well? Like, like in your marriage, right? When you want to see that healed and you just come and you, 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 you. How does that go? That just is like, oh, it just melts hearts and brings such, you, like, right? No. But when you come with, listen, here's, here's what I'm, I'm owning. Here's what I have done. Here's what I recognize and my need for grace. Jesus talks about get the log out of your eye before you pick the speck out of your brother's eye. That we would be people who realize, man, let me, let me take this out. Well, well, if you do that, then they're never going to. And so, okay, so then let's see how that works. Because <laughs> Jesus is saying, no, you repent. Because your repentance toward others, it's the way of saying, I'm coming back to Jesus again. I've drifted. Any sin against a person is first a sin against Jesus. You've drifted from Jesus, and now it's impacting others. So we repent and we come back. A verse that people love to quote about America, even though it's, America was not in existence at the time, is Second Chronicles 7, 14, a beautiful verse. If my people, it says, who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. Heal their land. Like they're enduring the judgment of God because of their sin, and the Lord is calling them back to Himself. And you do that by humbling yourself, taking ownership of the sin that we have done, turning from that, coming back to Him. And He always receives repentant sinners. It doesn't matter how great the sin is, it doesn't matter how dirty your garments have gotten, He always receives. The repentant sinners every time. We are prone to wander, prone to have our garments soiled in various ways. And we take ownership and we return to him. Let me ask you a question. Do you spend more time and energy blaming other people or repenting of your sin? What is more true of your, of your name, of your reputation, of your character? One who blames and points fingers or one who confesses and repents and realizes that when you point, there's other fingers pointing back at you. Which is more true of you? Which is more true of us as a church? Are you more upset about other people's sins or your own? Do you really embrace grace for you? Or do you just wish other people would get it? Are you looking out for the places in your own heart that need to wake up? Are you aware of the dying places in your own heart? Or are you too busy telling everybody else to wake up? In verse 1, Jesus says, the words of him who has 
the seven spirits of God. Now, how many spirits are there of God? There's one. But the number seven in the book of Revelation, we've said this multiple times, is a number signifying and symbolizing completeness, wholeness. And so in, in ev- the beginning of every letter, he has a description about Jesus, and that is a hint at what's something that's key in the letter. Last we talked about the sword in his mouth and the way that he speaks and how that... Well, this one, he talks about the seven spirits, which is the completeness of the Holy Spirit of God. And so he's talking to the church and he's bringing a word. And what does the Holy Spirit do in the life of the church? The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, Jesus told us. He convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment. He draws us back. He does not condemn us. Do you know the difference between conviction and condemnation? Condemnation is this. You're bad. Get out of here. Conviction is that was bad. Come here. Come here. That's the big difference. And the Spirit is speaking to the church saying, no, 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 that, that is bad and you're in danger in that. Come back. Come back to my heart. Come back to the purity and the essence of the gospel again. Remember it. Keep it. You've deserted the gospel. You've deserted intimacy with Jesus. Come back because here's the reward for those who repent. Those who repent get rewarded with a walk with Jesus. If you want to be a Christian or go to church so that you can get things from God, you don't know him. We say this all the time. The reward is Jesus. The reward is him. He is your reward that that he who is unstained would be with us who were stained. This is what he's, verse 4, there are a few who have not soiled their garments. They're not going the way of the culture, and their reward, he says, is they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. White symbolizes purity, and Jesus is describing this eternal walk that we have with him. It's intimacy with your creator, your maker, your savior. Look at verse 5, he says, He will be clothed in white garments, and I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. There's this talk in Revelation of this book of life. And when we read this verse, we can start to think, does that mean he's going to maybe blot us out? Well, five other times in Revelation, this book is mentioned. And two of them in Revelation 13 and Revelation 17, here's what we are told, is that our names have been in that book from the foundation of the world. That God wrote our names in his book. Like, where's the book? I don't know. He's talking about a book. He says he has a book. There's a book. You'll understand it all later. But there's a book with your name in it that he wrote long before your parents ever got together. And before your grandparents. And let's trace the whole family tree back long before any of that, which should be such good news because long before you screwed anything up, he already had your name written in there. And he doesn't walk around going, well, you did it now. and I'm going to take your name out of there. This is the security that he will never do that. He will never erase your name out of that book. Now, the world does that. It's called cancel culture. Sometimes bitter Christians do that too. And they erase your name and they're done with you. Jesus says, I will never do that. You are secure. I got you. And he says, I'm going to confess your name to my father before the angels. You accept the name of Jesus in the midst of a world that rejects Jesus. Jesus will gladly accept you and confess your name to the father and the angels. Like, I don't know, let, let's just go with me here. You show up to the pearly gates, and you're like, what in the world, right? And then here he comes, and, and Jesus is like, oh, oh, there are angels, who is this? Oh, I got him. Steve. is Monica. It was me. And I'm privileged to confess. I love to confess their name. before. And we start to think, well, what are we doing? We don't, like, how are we going to get in there, right? We're stained. 
I don't know if you've ever been to like a, a banquet or a fancy place and you had an outfit on. You're like, okay, I think maybe this will be good enough to be in there. But I really, I mean, I don't have as much money as those people have. And how does it like, what, what? and then you get something on it. Like you bump up against your vehicle before you go in. And now you've got like this stain on there. And you're like, oh man, the whole night, all you're going to be thinking about is that stain on your shirt. Some of you are like, yeah, I spilled ketchup on there. That's my, whatever it is. You think about that all the time and you're going, oh, well, when we get in there, the stains that we have, it's like Jesus goes, no, 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 I'm going to wear that. I already wore that on the cross. You wear my white robe of righteousness. There's no stains. You come in and you enjoy God's grace and his presence and intimacy with him now and forever. You got nothing to worry about. Took care of all that for you. You're in white. Let's go. Christianity is not just some belief system an intimate walk with a God who knows your name. So how are you? Are you alive? Are you dying? Where are you at? Let me ask this question. Where are we at as a church? Where are we as the people of God together? What kind of church are we going to be as we think about moving forward? A dying church? Or a church that's alive. In verse 4 he says, there are still a few people who haven't soiled their garments. It's significant because even in dead churches, there tends to be a few. There's still a few. And maybe you've been in one of those churches before. And you've been one of the few. Or you remember the few. That's like a, a remnant that remains. And God sees the remnant. God sees the few who have not deserted the gospel for something else. And in fact, you're watching online and you're sitting in this building right now because of a remnant. Because of a few. See, about 70 years ago, God started the church called St. Andrew's Lutheran Church. And it was started right here on this property. A church that treasured and loved the gospel of Jesus. You read some of the doctrines of the Lutheran faith and you will see richness regarding the gospel and what the church should be and what it means to live as the people of God in the world. And that was this church as people came here and and this city was served and loved and the gospel was proclaimed and children ran on the property. But what happened over time was they deserted the gospel. It starts usually in the hearts of leaders. And you drift from the preaching of the gospel. You drift from faithfulness to God's word. And this had happened to St. Andrew's Lutheran Church so much so that I'll show you this picture that I found on the pastor's Facebook page in 2016. That's him in the very back corner. That corner of the room was this corner of the room right here. As he was bowing down and praying with Muslims to the Muslim God. And he was doing it all in the name of, hey, all religions are the same. All gods are the same. That's the culture's view of God. It's called universalism. They're all the same. And so we can bow down and we can pray to this God. We can do that. We can call it whatever we want. That is a desertion of the gospel. That is an abandonment of the gospel. And when I saw that picture in 2016, I told our team, we got to pray. This man needs to repent, like Jesus says, or he needs to be removed. Because he's not good for this church body and what's left here. And he's not good for this city to distort the gospel like that. Two months later, he resigned and moved to France. All right, praise the Lord. And then there was a few. There was a remnant right here in St. Andrew's Lutheran Church who helped lead this place to become Restoration Church, where there could be life, where the preaching of the gospel, where the hearts of the people could be centered regularly on the gospel, and the hope of the gospel could be proclaimed for everyone. When you see the logo, when you see the cross on the roof, you know why that's there? 
because some that were there at the time wanted a cross that no matter what direction you came from, no matter where you came from, you could see there's a cross here, there's hope here. And so we took that and we said, that's it. No matter where you come from and what you've done or how stained you may be, you can be restored to God again at the cross of Jesus. He loves you. He forgives you. He welcomes you. Run to him. If you've wandered and drifted, repent and come back. Enjoy his grace for you. And let's be a church that for generations to come always centers ourselves on the hope of Jesus. Let's pray as we close. Lord, we love you. We are amazed at your incredible grace to us. That in spite of the stains that we, that we get on us, that we allow in our lives, you come and you still receive us and you remove that. Thank you for your faithfulness to always, always welcome the repentant sinners. Lord, we're thankful for those who have gone before us, the faithful ones. The ones who held on to their hope in you that did not soil their garments, that treasured you so that we might experience also what we're experiencing today of your grace. Thank you for the church. God, would you keep us as much as we want to guard and keep the gospel, would we rest in the reality that you're guarding and keeping us? Holy Spirit, would you be alive in this church that we would listen to you and hear you and desire the things of God? Would you convict us that when we start to drift down the ocean and we start to head away, that we would hear your convicting voice saying, no, that's wrong. Come be with me. Would you fill us with your love in such a way that we live as children of light, that we would be good news to this city and from here for generations to come. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, we want to sing because when God does a work in your heart, you, you sing back to him and he loves it. So I want to invite you to stand and sing as we treasure what Jesus has done for us. We've also got communion that's available for you. Communion is not just religious activity that we do. Communion is the statement, Jesus' body was broken, his blood was shed for me that I can be forgiven and restored to God and that's my only hope. So during this song or after the song, you can take communion here in the sides or in the back. But let's continue to sing. If you need prayer after the service, we'll be available to pray for you in anything that you need. But let's continue to worship our God together.
let that drive you and lead you and cover you as you go out. That you are a child of God because of what Christ has done for you. You are not your past. You are not your sins. You're not your stage and all that stuff. You are who he says you are. And you can go and receive that grace from him so that you can give love to others. May you be a blessing and a light and a joy to the world as you go out this week. If you need to talk about orphan care or what it looks like to get involved or connected, we'll be in the back with that card. Glad to serve you in that way. Have a good week. Go in peace.